All right. Going to be doing another sermon request this week. And you might have an idea, of course, by the title and by what I'm wearing. And that is the subject of self-defense and the Bible. What does the Bible teach? <clears throat> what, are, what can a Christian do? Um, and we're going to look at the arguments both for and against the uh, thing of self-defense. Now, if you've noticed here, I am wearing firearms. All right. And um, if you're anti-gun, that's fine. You have that option, which we'll see later on. But uh, there's also the option of being for firearms. And I'm going to explain to you by the end of the study why I wear firearms, and particularly so here at this property. Um, I don't ever come out here without a gun. And I'm going to show you why in just a couple minutes. But uh, first of all, let me just show you here. This is a very lightweight shoulder rig system. This is a um, system that I wear a lot of times if I don't want to carry a lot of weight and uh, things, or I'm, if I'm working in things, I have a lot of, you know, don't want to have a lot of weight on me. And this is just a small, lightweight handgun. This is a, see if I can get this, a Glock 45 automatic. It is loaded. Okay, you can see the bullets there inside the magazine. And this is just a small little subcompact, lightweight automatic pistol. Automatic does not mean that you pull the trigger and it goes ba -ba 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 -ba, or something like that. You have to pull the trigger each time that you want a bullet to go off. But you don't have to cock the hammer each time. In fact, it doesn't have a hammer. So, striker fired, but anyhow. For those of you out there that know guns, you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but the other system that I have on down here, you can't really see it too well on the camera, but this is my belt that I wear a lot of times if I'm back, actually walking back deep in the property, back in things, because this 45 automatic isn't so much a good gun for bigger, larger game, uh, larger animals. Uh, this one here is much better for that. Okay, this is just an old single action revolver. This is actually the second handgun I've ever owned, so it's, I've had it for quite a few years. This is a Ruger Blackhawk 45. Just in case you're wondering where my email address came from, it's Blackhawk 45. Okay, so I had that long before I was in ministry, so I just kind of stayed with the email address. But this is what it was named after Blackhawk 45 caliber. And uh, these bullets in here are a lot bigger than 45 automatic okay this is actually a uh, a oversized kind of a plus p uh, ammunition round um, very large grain weight i think it's about a 325 grain i think and uh more powerful powder and everything else um, because normal 45 long colt bullets aren't overly great at uh, stopping big animals and um so this one here now is, is the bullets are more powerful. They're ramped up kind of so that it can drop a bigger animal if that happens. And you say, well, Brian, you're just paranoid. You're, you're not going to run into anything out there in nature. Well, here's some video I'm going to roll in here of uh, walking up on our lane up there. And you can see here's some bear tracks and some moose tracks right together in the same area there, the same mud. And uh, that's right on our land. So... You have to be aware of that kind of a thing when you live in a wilderness area. You have to be aware of the fact that there are animals out there that can do you serious bodily harm. All right. Um, so you have to be very wary of that. And uh, that's just reality. Okay. And, but now we're going to get into the study. Let me grab my Bible here. All right. Now, we're going to see some of the arguments that people are going to use against weapons, okay? And I say weapons because I understand that there are some viewers out there that are in an area where they can't use a gun, okay? Let me take this one, my revolver off here. It's a lot of weight to be having on while I'm trying to do this sermon. Uh, you can see the setup here a little bit better. See, just an old leather cowboy rig. Got some extra ammunition there. I don't carry a whole lot of extra ammunition. Don't really intend on getting in a gunfight with a moose. Most of them are unarmed, but they do have antlers. So, you know, or horns, I guess. You, I'm not sure if, I always get that confused if moose have antlers or horns. Deer and elk and things, they have antlers, but I don't know what you call moose. 
I've heard both. But uh, anyhow, <laughs> so uh, when I say weapons for self-defense, I realize that, like I said, that there are people that can't have guns wherever country you're in and things like that. So, uh, you know, it's a matter of do I fight if somebody is trying to hurt me or my family? That's what the real issue is here. That's what we're really going to be talking about. And of course, you know, if you live in a wilderness area where there's going to be dangerous animals, well, then you need something to protect yourself from them. A lot of times animals will run away from you out in the wild and there are things that you can do. You can yell at them. You can make plenty of noise while you're walking back through the woods. And usually that works. But there are certain times of the year, if it's in the rut, when they're mating and things, they'll get very aggressive. Um, if a mother bear is around her, her little cubs and you get too close to the cubs, not even knowing it sometimes, um, that can be a problem. So, and the Bible talks about that, uh, the, you know, about the a mother being robbed of her whelps, you know, her little cubs. And um, so, you know, you have to be aware of that when you live in a wilderness area. So, but we're going to be talking most, mostly today, not about four-legged dangers, but about two-legged dangers, other people. So what's the first thing that you're going to hear? And please, by the way, listen to these different scriptures that we go through before you start putting the comments down there. You shouldn't have a gun because of this, this, and that. All right, we're going to talk about all those. First thing you're going to hear is, how about turn the other cheek? You shouldn't carry around one of these nasty guns because you're supposed to turn the other cheek. If somebody comes up, slaps you, turn the other cheek. Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. You can turn in your Bible to... King James Bible to Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. And if you're new to this ministry, the reason I say King James Bible is because these new versions that they're coming out with all the time, they're, they're messing up vital doctrine and I can't even relate to these things anymore. They're from the Roman Catholic Church. They are traced back to Egypt and things. So, you know, we need to have a standard here on this channel and the standard is King James Bible why I have King James Video Ministries. But uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. Now when you see that, you have heard, or it is written, that's a reference back to the Old Testament. So let's go back to Leviticus chapter 24, and we'll see where this scripture comes from. Go back in your Old Testament there to Leviticus 24. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 17 says here, And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And he that killeth a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. Now when it's talking about beast, it's not talking about some big old moose comes out of the woods over there and comes charging across the water here toward, towards me and i got to drop the thing here on camera. Wouldn't that be something? It's not talking about that. What it's talking about is, a domestic type of an animal. You'll read about that in the book of Leviticus. Uh, a bull or something charges somebody and they have to kill it or, or whatever. It's talking about domestic animals, uh, farm type animals. If you have to kill somebody's animal, then you have to make it good. You have to pay for that. Verse 19, And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And he that killeth a beast, he shall restore it. And he that killeth a man, he shall be put to death. Death penalty there in the Old Testament. Uh, ye shall have one manner of law as well for the stranger as for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God. So you can see there in the Old Testament that the, that the death penalty was definitely in force. You say, well, uh, that's not true for today, though, anymore, because we're to love our enemies and things like that. So we don't have the death penalty today. You might want to rethink that. Turn to Acts chapter 25. Back to the New Testament. Acts chapter 25, definitely for a Christian today. We're going to see what the greatest Christian that ever lived has to say about the death penalty. Acts chapter 25, verse 10. It says, Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, look at this, I have refused not to die. 
But if there be none of these things whereof they accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. So Paul there is on trial and he says, hey, I haven't done anything wrong. Okay. And I'm not trying to say that I'm guilty and I'm trying to get out of this thing because he goes on to say there in verse 11, if I be an offender and I've done anything worthy of death, then I refuse not to die. Go ahead and execute me. You know, and that's the, the stand that a Christian should take. I mean, if you're coming around just killing Bible-believing Christians like the Catholics did for centuries simply because of our beliefs, that's not really worthy of death, okay? But if I'm out someplace and, you know, I'd see somebody and I'd get angry and I'd lose my temper and, and I'd shoot them or kill them or stab them or whatever else, uh, then I should die for that. If I'm a murderer, I myself should be executed as a murderer. There's nothing wrong with that. So... Does the death penalty still hold true for today? Yeah, it does. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you should believe in the death penalty. Matthew chapter 5. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 39. It's kind of funny. I heard uh, Kent Hovind say the one time years ago, he said about a story where some guy was being taken out to be hung, out to be executed. And somebody said uh, in the crowd, they were all upset, you know, and they said that, uh, you know, this isn't, this isn't going to stop crime. And they said, how is this going to stop crime? And the executioner pointed at the man that was being taken out, and he said, uh, it's going to stop crime for him. Yeah. But I can tell you right now, if people were being executed publicly, like used to happen here in America, in uh, town square or whatever else, they set up the gallows, and you get this guy who just killed a bunch of people, or killed a person, hang him. Little kids get to see that and stuff like that. Guess what? It's a powerful incentive to obey the law. See, if you do anything worthy of death, you shouldn't refuse to die if you're saved. All right, but look at verse 39 here, Matthew chapter 5, verse 39. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay, um, you say, well, uh, see, Ryan, that proves you should never have self-defense. Really? So if some guy's coming at me, I'll get out my pocket knife here. Some guy's coming at me like this, see, see knife, and he's coming at me like this. Um, that's not smiting me on the cheek. Okay, if some guy's coming at me and he's on drugs and he's out of his mind, bonkers out of his mind, and he's coming at me, and my wife is standing there beside me, I'm pulling my gun out and saying, back off. And if he keeps coming, pow. That's going to be the way it works. Okay? Um, now, if some guy comes up to me, and he says, you dirty, rotten, stupid Christian, you, I hate you. I hate all you stupid Christians. And he comes up and goes, and hits me right across the face punches me in the face like that. Should I pull my gun out and shoot the guy? No. You see, in the military or in law enforcement, they have a, a doctrine, so to speak, and that doctrine is called escalation of force. And if you have an improper escalation of force, what you have is a police officer that loses his cool or somebody in the military that loses their cool. If somebody comes out to you like this and they're unarmed, okay, you have no reason to get your gun out. Okay. Now, if the guy comes out and he's got a knife, and that knife is dripping with blood, get your gun out quickly. Or if the guy himself has a gun. See? You escalate the level of force depending on the threat involved. That's what's going on here. If somebody comes up and smites you on the face, just whack like that, you stupid Christian, bam, they hit you. You say, try that side. You're not going to get through to me. Somebody you're out preaching on the street or something, this happens, you know. I've seen this happen to different people. I've not had it happen to me. Uh, different times I've been preaching on the street, but um, I've heard and seen about this, talked to guys that this has happened to, and they'll be out preaching on the street, and somebody's coming up screaming at them. They're all mad and everything, and they just keep preaching, and all of a sudden that person just goes bang and hits them in the face. What do you do at that point in time? You say, well, I fight back. I just, okay, that's enough. No, 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 no. You say, hit that side too. 
you just keep preaching. Now, if they start to threaten your life, if they actually start to come and try to claw your eyes out or try to choke you or something, we're moving into a different level of threat. And you might have to escalate your level of violence to protect yourself. All right. That verse in Matthew chapter 5 does not disprove the right of self-defense for a Christian. You say, but uh, okay, Brian, but is that for us? Well, Matthew chapter 5, there again, if you look in there in verse uh, 39, if you jump up to verse 35, it says, Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Jesus Christ, when he gives the Sermon on the Mount, he's actually giving the bylaws, so to speak, the constitution, if you will, for the millennial kingdom. That's why he's calling Jerusalem the city of the great king. Jerusalem, Jerusalem is not the city of the great king right now, but it will be in the future. So again, you have to be careful, careful doctrinally. You say, well, then how do we rightly divide this thing? Well, is there an instruction in the Pauline epistles that lines up with Matthew 5.39? Let's look about that. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter three. We're going to have the you have the instructions here for a bishop, a preacher. Okay, it says here this is a true saying: If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now look at verse three: Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, not or, but patient, not a brawler not covetous. Okay, we'll stop there. Did you notice the two things there? No striker. And also it says there, not a brawler. Okay? In other words, when you're a striker or a brawler, you're a fighter. Now, when you become a preacher, when you are have the oversight of the flock, part of the, the thing of, of what you need to do when you're a preacher is you need to be able to maintain your cool. You need to live as an example. Be above reproach. So if you're going out and you're always picking fights with people and wanting to beat people up and stuff, that's uh, not a very good example. Okay? But again, what's it talking about? It's talking about the thing of people coming and physically punching you or, you know, like that. And you saying, okay, I'm not going to get into a fight. Hey, whatever. You know, you want to hit me or you want to yell at me and whatever else. Whatever. You know, I'm going to pre keep preaching the word. Don't lose your cool. That's all that's going on there. That does not mean some guy's trying to break into your house to rape your wife and you say, well, I'm not supposed to be a striker or a brawler. I'm going to turn the other cheek. That's not what that means. And when you try to make it say that, you're perverting the meaning of the text. It doesn't work that way. All right, argument number two. How about uh, love your enemies? Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. This is another one you're going to hear. They say, how could you shoot somebody? How could you shoot some guy that's trying to hurt you when you're supposed to love him? Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. This is where we're going to start out here. Matthew 5, 43 through 45. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Okay? Now you say, well, see, Brian, we're supposed to love our enemies. How could you shoot an enemy and love them at the same time? Well... Again, let's look at the threat assessment here. What's really going on in these verses? Look at verse 44. Bless them that curse you. Is that threatening to your life? Or to the lives of your children or wife? No. Somebody cursing you. Whatever. Uh, do good to them that hate you. Somebody hates you. Well, you should be kind of used to that as a Christian. How about uh, pray for them, which for them which despitefully use you? If somebody's using you, does that give you the right to pull a gun out and shoot them? No. 
give you the right to get a baseball bat out and hit them over the head? No. How about persecute you? No. And I do believe, by the way, that uh, when it comes to the thing of Christians being persecuted, um, that gets very, very sensitive in through there. I mean, you know, there's there's just a, a thing about people coming and trying to get you in trouble with the law. And you might have to go to prison. You might have to, you know, you see that in the Bible. But, you know, when there's wholesale rank slaughter like the Catholics have done to, for instance, the Waldensian people. They were coming in there to the Waldensian people and they're just trying to kill everybody in the whole village, you know, over in northern Italy. This is back in the um, 1600s is when a lot of this was going on. By the 1800s, pretty much all the Waldensians had been killed by the Catholics. But you'd see this thing time and time and time again where the Catholics are coming in just trying to wipe out a whole people. And the Waldensians are going, hey, we haven't done anything. All we've done is we're not going to convert to Catholicism. And so that's why you're coming in here to persecute us. That's not acceptable. And so the Waldensians would fight back. And the Lord gave them some mighty victories through that whole thing. Now see, if, if I'm out on the street or something, or I'm out and I'm putting out a tract, and somebody comes up to me and they say, I saw what you're doing, you, you disgusting Bible believer. Or they see my truck or whatever else, and they come up and they're trying to yell at me, and they start to hit me or beat me up, I'm not going to pull a gun out and kill them. Okay? I'm not going to do that. I'm being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, if it gets to a point where they're going to, they're, my life is being threatened, they start, they pull a knife and they're going to stab me to death or something like that. Well, I have a wife to talk, to think about, you know, and I'm going to have to do something about that. Now, if there are armies of Catholics coming around and slaughtering any Christian that they can find, well, that's a different story. Okay, you got to pray about that stuff. You see. But let's uh, look at Luke chapter 6, verse 27. Luke chapter 26. I'm sorry, not... What did I say? Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 27. Excuse me. Luke chapter 6, verse... 27 through 35 it says here but i say unto you which hear love your enemies do good to them which hate you bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you and unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek offer also the other and him that taketh away thy cloak forbid not to take thy cloak coat also give to every man that asketh of thee and of him that taketh away thy goods ask them not again and as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Okay? Now there's a whole lot of things in there that, that go well beyond just the thing of, of whether or not you should defend yourself. Okay? There comes the thing of actually doing good for people. Somebody says, hey, can I borrow this or whatever? You know, and according to those scriptures, you're supposed to. You say, do you believe that's for today? Well, instruction in righteousness, yes. Doctrinally, I believe it's again pointed towards that millennial kingdom. Why? Satan's bound for a thousand years, cast in the bottomless pit. Why? Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning on the earth, and we, his saints, are ruling and reigning with him. So there's going to be justice. So somebody borrows something from you, and they don't want to give it back, there's going to be judgment. Right now, the system is corrupt. So you got to be careful with some of that stuff. Again, brethren, rightly divide the word of truth. Compare these things with the Pauline epistles. But uh, let's go on to the next objection to self-defense that people are going to bring up. And this is one I've had thrown at me. They'll say, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay? So you're not supposed to have any kind of carnal physical weapons because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Let's look about that. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let 
we're going to see about this argument here. Uh, down where I came from, there down there in Pennsylvania, there was a group called Charity Ministries, and we actually had this one put on us the one time. Me and a brother, we were talking to them, and and uh, they they're out doing street evangelism, which handing out tracts and things, which you know that's that's good. But uh, they we got to talking to the one guy and and uh, asked him, you know, do you guys are you guys pacifists? And he said, yeah, we are. And this is one of the verses that he quoted. So let's see what the verse actually says. Second Corinthians chapter ten, verse one. Now I, Paul, be myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold, which when I am, excuse me, when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, so there's where you see the verse come in at. And what Paul's basically saying there is that he was very, very meek and mild, mannered around these people. And, you know, he tried to abase himself. He tried to humble himself. And, you know, like Jesus Christ taught, you know, that those that are greatest among, you know, the body of believers there should be the servant of all. So that's what Paul was trying to say there. But what he goes on to say is this thing about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, okay, but are mighty through God. You say, well, then what are these weapons? Glock pistols and Ruger Blackhawks? No. Keep reading. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Um, what's the warfare we're talking about here? Up there. That's what Paul's talking about. He's not saying, um, you know, you shouldn't have firearms or you shouldn't have weapons of any kind because, after all, our weapons aren't carnal. He's not talking about the physical realm. He's talking about spiritually. That's why he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into, into captivity every thought. See, it's about up here, controlling your mind. You say, well, how do I control my mind? Well, with a 45 automatic that you pull out and if there's a devil in your room, you shoot him. No, <laughs> uh, they can't exactly be seen very well. Okay, the spiritual realm is invisible. You can't see it. You say, well, how do I fight an invisible enemy? with the sword of the Spirit. King James Bible, the Word of God. This is how you fight. This is the powerful weapon that Paul's referring to there. Okay, this is the mighty weapon, excuse me. The mighty weapon. It's not carnal. It's not this over here. It's not a handgun. It's a sword, a spiritual sword. That's how you fight your battles, to win up here in the realm of the mind. When you need to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, when you're thinking dirty thoughts, when you're thinking covetousness, when you're thinking idolatry, when you're thinking whatever, the way that you defeat that is through the Word of God. Read it. Quote it. Study it. Say it out loud. It's a spiritual weapon. That's all that's going on in that passage there. You can't use those verses to try and disprove that Christians should somehow not have firearms or something. Okay, now this next one kind of goes hand in hand with it. Another one that you'll get is, well, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So why would you shoot somebody that's flesh and blood? Oh, huh. see? Well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. We'll see about this passage here. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 12 says here, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay, so the argument is made then, well, but you see, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. It's against spiritual wickedness. So therefore, why would you fight against flesh and blood? Well, again, we're talking about spiritual struggles here, folks. We're not talking about somebody coming into your house to try to do you bodily harm. You're on the street, somebody tries to rob you, 
tries to steal your money or whatever, you know, it's a different story. We're talking in the Bible here, we're talking about these last two passages anyhow, we're talking about not physical attacks, but spiritual attacks. And again, look at the next couple of verses here, uh, verse 13 through 17, we're going to see that it's spiritual. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Okay? So again, um, when it says about these pieces of armor, are they physical pieces of armor? No. You say, do you have the helmet of salvation on, Brian, right now? Yes, I do. Jesus Christ is the head. Okay? He is the head of the faith. He is the head of the body of Christ. So, in a in a way, it's like he's the head. He's the helmet of salvation, but you can't see it. Breastplate can't see that. Loins girt about with truth can't see that. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace can't see that. The only part of the armor that you can see, the only part of the armament, I should say, is the sword of the spirit. That's the only thing that you can really see physically. Okay, so again, using these verses to try and prove that Christians shouldn't have firearms like this thing, it's not a good argument. Here's another good one. How about, uh, well, the Bible says that they shall beat their swords into plowshares. You know, Isaiah chapter 2. I'll show you where this occurs at. It's another one that you're going to hear, and, and actually the United Nations building... Up there in New York, uh, actually, well, I shouldn't say up there, I'm still thinking Pennsylvania. Um, down in New York, way down there, from where I'm at right now, living. Uh, the United Nations building down there actually has this scripture on the front of their building. At least they did, I don't know. I, you know, things change, but I, I assume that they still do. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Huh. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Not to New York City, but to Jerusalem. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Why? Because Jesus Christ will be physically reigning on the earth for the millennial kingdom. Don't believe anything but premillennial teaching. Okay, I have a study on that. You can hear that. Verse 4, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Okay, now you say, well, couldn't we do something similar with the United Nations? Well, let's see. Since the United Nations was founded in 1945, they've sponsored over 150 wars. Um, hardly uh, beating your sword and uh, plowshare and your spear into a pruning hook. Um, they're not really causing many nations to go into gardening or raising of crops. What's that going to take? It's going to take the Lord Jesus Christ to come back and physically rule on the earth. He's the only one that can put a stop to war. No amount of people on this earth, all these united nuts and everything else, they're not going to stop war. No way. And you're living in a fantasy land too, by the way, if you think that if we all give up our firearms, then we can all live at peace. Um, there's just as many people, if not more, that get stabbed to death or beaten to death or poisoned or whatever. There's a lot of different ways to kill people. And ironically, a lot of times it's far more efficient to kill people in other ways other than guns. Okay? So don't think, oh, the guns, if we could just take the guns, the guns, the guns, the guns are the problem. No, 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 no. The guns aren't the problem. Sin is the problem. That's the whole issue. Okay, now go to Micah chapter 4. 
back towards the New Testament, one of the minor prophet books, the book of Micah. Kind of a tough one to find here. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Let's read this. It says here, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Okay? Now you do have a rebellion that comes up at the end of the millennial kingdom there, but there's no battle. The rebellion is raised up by Satan, and the Lord just goes and burns them. Just fire down out of heaven and just burns the whole thing. There's not a battle at all. No fight. Okay. So, when the Bible says that in the millennial kingdom, there's not going to be any more war after that, that's absolutely true. But not before then. Man isn't about to bring this thing in. But let's look at an interesting prophecy which takes place before the Millennial Kingdom. Joel chapter 3. Back a few books to the book of Joel. Joel chapter 3. Uh, verse 9 and 10. Okay, it says here, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all them... There's something running through the weeds there. <sighs> Getting ready to pull my gun here. But uh, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near and let, let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Huh. So in other words, before people can get rid of their weapons, you're actually supposed to take your farm implements and turn them into weapons. And the weak are supposed to say, I am strong in that time period. What's the Bible prophesying here? A time of peace in our future or a time of war? War. You say, prove it, okay? Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Is there war coming in the future? And I saw one in the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Sounds like war. Yeah. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Huh. So the Bible is predicting massive amounts of war in the future. But you should be disarmed for this time period. And I realize, you know, somebody out there is saying, well, as Christians, we're not going to go into that time. We're going to be in heaven before the Antichrist and the rider on the red horse is unleashed. And that's true. Very true. But um, the Bible also says about, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them. So, there's massive chaos also before the time of the time of Jacob's trouble starts. Now, of course, you know, I believe that there's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen that are bad at the rapture. When the rapture happens and the body of Christ leaves, I think that little babies and children and things are going to go with us. And I have a preacher rapture moment on that. You can watch that. But uh, the fact of the matter is that I think things are going to get worse, a whole lot worse. 
Uh, things are very, very shaky, very volatile right now, and uh, I'm glad I'm armed. You say, O'Brien, oh, uh, why, why would you say a thing like that? Because I'm a realist, because I understand history. History, the history of man has been one of war and fighting and death. Ever since uh, Cain and Abel, murder, fighting, death, war, bloodshed, that's reality. It's not reality to pretend that if we get rid of all of the weapons, everybody will get along. That's nonsense. Okay, That can't happen until the Lord gets rid of a whole bunch of people in the time of Jacob's trouble and comes back and rules with a military dictatorship. And you can't trust anybody else but the Lord Jesus with something like that. You can't give anybody absolute power unless they are perfect, morally speaking. So, keep that in mind. All right. How about another one? Another objection to the thing of self-defense. How about thou shalt not kill? Somebody could make that as an argument. All right. Let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. Back to the passage of Scripture where the Ten Commandments are given. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13 says, Thou shalt not kill. Well, there you have it. You're not allowed to defend yourself, right? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 17. Deuteronomy 5, verse 17. Again, thou shalt not kill. Okay, there you have the two different passages. Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5, talk about the Ten Commandments. That's where the Ten Commandments are given. Now let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 6 through 11. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 6. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, Neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare him, neither shalt thou conceal him. Now look at verse 9. But thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he hath sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now let me read one more verse here, verse 11. And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more and any such wickedness as this is among you. Wait a second. The Ten Commandments just said, thou shalt not kill. But here it says, you shall kill somebody that's going after another god. Um, how does that work? One time you're commanded not to kill and here you're commanded to kill. Well, you can say the Bible contradicts, or you can actually rightly divide the word of truth, like a Christian would do. Lost people try to find contradictions so they can get rid of the Bible. But um, the fact of the matter is, how do you rightly divide this? You say, well, there's obviously death penalties in the Old Testament. There's obviously war in the Old Testament, sanctioned by God, commanded by God. So what does thou shalt not kill mean? Turn to Matthew chapter 19. The Bible always defines itself. And these people that uh, back away from the Bible and say, oh, it's full of contradictions and it has problems and everything, uh, they're the ones that are lazy and don't actually want to study the Bible to find the answers to these questions. Matthew chapter 19, verse 18 and 19. Okay, it says here, He saith unto him, which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. 
Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Hmm. So there you have Jesus defining what it means, thou shalt not kill. It's in reference to murder. That's what's going on there. We read about that earlier. Okay. When somebody murders somebody, you say, okay, now you're going to be executed. If I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die, Paul said. So the command there is, when it says, thou shalt not kill, it means thou shalt do no murder. That's what's going on there. Kill in reference to premeditated murdering of somebody. The Bible is not condemning you having to kill somebody who breaks into your home and is intent on doing you bodily harm. The Bible is not condemning that. So if you're finding somebody that's trying to use that as an argument, that doesn't work. How about uh, another one? Another argument against self-defense. They'll say, the Bible says, if you take up the sword, you will perish by the sword. Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 50. It says here, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they, and laid hands on Jesus, and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand, and drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priest, and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. There you see it. Thinkest thou that I am, cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Okay. See? So there you go. Argument's over. If you take up the sword, die by the sword. Perish by the sword there. So get rid of guns. I'm going to take this gun off here and throw it in the lake or in the river. No. It doesn't work that way. I want you to notice a couple things. First of all, Jesus said, put up again your sword into his place. He didn't say, hey, whoa, Peter, what you, you got a sword? Are you kidding me? Give it over to the soldiers. Hand it in. They're here for a sword buyback program. You know, He didn't tell them to hand in his sword. He didn't say, hey, what do you, what do you got a sword for? We're going to see later why he didn't say that. But the fact is, it was perfectly all right for him to have his sword. But Jesus was saying, hey, this isn't the time to fight. Put that thing away. He had an inappropriate escalation of the level of force, you see. Okay, they grabbed Jesus. That wasn't a, a violent act that Peter should have pulled his sword out and went, <clears throat> and nailed the guy and cut his ear off. That was an inappropriate use of force on Peter's part. Number two, the second thing you need to realize from this passage, Peter was trying to stop Jesus Christ from being crucified. And if you read earlier on where Jesus is explaining to Peter how he's going to have to die on the cross, Peter's like, be it far from thee, Lord. No, no, I don't want to hear about that. And Jesus is like, well, that's the way it's going to be, Peter. Sorry, you know, that's just the way it is. And he you know, actually re refers to him. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, see? So again, Peter's in sin here. Third point I want to make is, notice also there in verse 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? So Jesus is saying, hey, this isn't about me being weak here, and I can't defend myself. I can pray to the Father, and I can say, I need some angels, and he'll have twelve legions of angels. Just like that. And no army in the world is going to beat twelve legions of angels. I don't think so. And by the way, in Revelation chapter 19, if you want to see a future fulfillment, there again, people try to stick Jesus in the mode that he was in when he first came to this earth. And they say, that's the meek, mild-mannered Jesus. He's never going to be violent. He's never going to do anything violent. Uh, well, you really need to read Revelation chapter 19 because he comes back and he has more than 12 legions of angels with him when he comes back. And uh, he's going to do some pretty horrible stuff to the lost world at that point in time. Horrible if you're a lost sinner, but righteous if you are saved. Just and righteous. All right, here's another one. P. 
people say that you're to seek peace. You are to be peaceful as a Christian. You are to have peace that passeth understanding. So if we're to be peaceful as Christians, how then can you pull a gun and shoot somebody? See? See how inconsistent that is? Let's look and see what the Bible says. Psalm 34. Turn back to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 12 through 14. Let's read this. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from seeking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Okay. Now again, to use this as an argument against having weapons is rather kind of foolish. Because what this is saying is seek peace. You know, do good. All right, it's, it's saying try to depart from evil. Try to avoid danger. All right, um, if I'm walking back through this area over here, I mean, you can see it's really, really thick over in that area over there. And if I'm walking back through there, I'm going to make as much noise as I can. Why? If there's an animal out there, I want them to leave before I get to them. And they usually will if you're making a lot of noise. You know, if I see an animal up ahead, I see him, he's coming down this road over here, and I say, hey, you know, I, I see him. I'm not going to pull my gun out and start blasting at him. I'm going to try to avoid the conflict. I'm going to say, hey, hey, and I'll start yelling, waving my arms or something. Now, if he starts to run at me, well, decision time, you know. And it is the same thing with people. I'm going to try and avoid trouble. I'm not going to go down into the bad section of town where the drugs are dealt and they have the gangs, members that are in control of it and things. I'm not going to go down there at 2 o'clock in the morning, Okay. That's what this is saying. I'm trying to seek peace. I'm not looking for trouble. You see? But what happens if trouble comes? No more options. I have to do something about that. You got it? Turn to Romans chapter 12. Back to the New Testament. Romans chapter 12. Here's your New Testament tie into this thing about seeking peace. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. It says here, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And again, people say, see, Brian, we're back to the thing of you have to love your enemies. How can you love your enemies when you're shooting them and killing them? Well, what are we talking about here? What's the level of threat from the enemy? I have some guy that I don't like at the place where I work. Um, should I just walk in someday and say, I hate you, you know, pull my gun and kill the guy? Well, of course not. That's ridiculous. Don't do a thing like that. I have a neighbor that I don't like. I have a family member I don't like. I know you feel like shooting them sometimes, but don't do that. <laughs> you know, whoever, whoever you have as your enemy, what do you do? Try to be nice to them. Try to de-escalate that level of force. You know, that's why a good police officer, when they get into a bad situation, some guy's there and he's yelling and he's mad and he's angry and everything, and the, and the police officer comes and he says, hey, buddy, just calm down, all right? I'm here to help. Now, now, please explain to me what's wrong. What's he trying to do? He's trying to de-escalate the level of force. He's trying to de-escalate the threat, excuse me, de-escalate the threat level. Bring the threat level down. Why? Well, you know, you can be coming in there and be a macho guy and just say, all right, pull the gun, bam, pull your taser out, you know, get the guy. But there's a good chance you're going to get hurt in that same scuffle. You're better off to try and de-escalate that threat. Try and bring it down. And as Christians, that's what we're supposed to do. If it's possible, live peaceably with all men. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably. I mean, if you're out preaching on the street and some guy comes up to you and slaps you in the face and you say, whatever, and you keep preaching and he slaps you again in the face and you say, all right, buddy, you know, just go away, please. 
and you keep and you go back to preaching and, and the guy punches you in the stomach and then he hits somebody beside you well okay now he's pushing a little bit too hard and if there aren't any police there and if and if that's not a possibility to get him there quickly and whatever well you might have to take care of that situation he's threatening your life at that point and again if he's just using his hands and his fists and whatever don't pull a gun on him in fact i you know i've talked about it with different brethren that go out preaching on the street and i don't think it's a real good idea to carry a gun in a situation like that you say well it's a really bad place that we're going well maybe you need to pray about going to there okay but um again there's arguments back and forth there i can't totally say no i can't totally say yes <laughs> um this is an issue of liberty when you get down to it we're going to see that as we continue but uh we're going to look at two more arguments here that are going to be used number one uh, another one here is Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. So again, you see Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So as his followers, we are also supposed to be peaceful people. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Go back in the Bible to Isaiah 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Seven. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Um... See, people have kind of a warped interpretation of Jesus Christ. They think when it says Prince of Peace, that that means he comes down and he's just kind of effeminate and soft and everybody gets along then. Uh, that doesn't mean that. Uh, the Bible elsewhere says that he rules with a rod of iron. And it's a military dictatorship that Jesus Christ sets up. So the peace that comes there, and it's funny because the Antichrist tries to do the same thing, only he fails. But uh, Jesus Christ succeeds where the Antichrist failed. And Jesus brings in peace through superior firepower. His superior firepower. Okay, I don't believe that uh, the saints are going to be doing any fighting at all. I think that the Lord's going to take care of all that. We're just going to come down with him, you know, riding behind him through the battle of Armageddon. And then he's going to send us out to gather the nations to bring them to Jerusalem to be judged. Whoever's left at that time. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. You say, well, I just still think, Brian, that, uh, that Jesus is a man of peace, and he loves, he just loves people, and it's just wonderful. Let's see about that. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. Um, I haven't met too many lions that are peaceful. You say, what about captivity? Jesus isn't a lion that's in captivity. Okay. <laughs> um, he's going to be very angry and very much filled with wrath when he comes back. You don't want to face Jesus Christ when he comes back. All right. Bad deal. You say, prove that. Okay. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, verse 11, down through 21. I like to read these verses occasionally just to keep it in mind that this is what's going to happen to the wicked, lost world. They seem so proud. They seem so powerful right now. They seem unstoppable. Um, the Lord's going to stop them. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, 
that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Okay? So, so much for Jesus being a pacifist. And, you know, you say, well, that's such a horrible thing. Uh, you got to remember who he's dealing with here. He's dealing with people that have taken the mark of the beast. They can't get saved at that point in time. All right? You're dealing with something that hasn't happened yet. That's never happened in history. There's never been a time where you have all these people, 200 million man army of people that are lost and cannot get saved. But that's what it's going to be there in Revelation chapter 19. Okay. And you say, well, uh, I just, I, I don't know if I want to be part of that, Brian. I, I just, I'm a pacifist and I don't think it's right to be part of this violence. You know, we'll turn to Psalm 58. You want to see a little prophecy for yourself. And I do believe that this is a reference to when Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent and destroys that Antichrist army. And what happens to the saints? What are they doing? Psalm 58, verse 10 and 11. It says here, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that a man shall say, Verily there is a reward for the righteous. Verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. Okay? You say, we got to bathe our feet in the blood of the wicked? Well, if you read in other passages, it talks about this Antichrist army when they're slaughtered, that the blood is up to the horse bridle. We're coming down riding behind Jesus Christ on our horses at the second coming. So Jesus rides right through that muck that he just made with the sword of his mouth, slaughtered that whole 200 million man army. We ride down right behind him. You're going to be splashing through that blood of the wicked. Kind of a problem for you if you're a pacifist. Kind of a problem if you're trying to lock Jesus into what he was when he first came to the earth. The lamb that was slain. And that's what Jesus is always going to be. He's always going to be meek and mild and, and lowly. And No, Jesus is coming back as a conquering warrior. A king that sets up his kingdom, his military dictatorship on the earth. That's why the Antichrist tries to mimic it. 